It's been called a textbook example of ethnic cleansing by the UN. Entire villages razed to the ground, thousands of casualties, and even children thrown into fires. This is the Rohingya Genocide, Myanmar's modern-day attempt to wipe out an ethnicity within its borders simply because of their religious beliefs. Yet despite the atrocities involved, it's received surprisingly little attention in Western media, earning the situation names like a forgotten genocide or even the crisis the world is ignoring. Because while most of the world's attention is soaked up on the more recent explosions in Ukraine and between Israel and Palestine, nearly 600,000 Rohingyas are currently living in the world's largest refugee camp, constantly in danger of succumbing to malnutrition, disease, wildlife, and more. So today, we're going to bring you details of this unfolding story, the tragedy that doesn't seem to have an end in sight. Now, the Rohingya people of Southern Asia belong to an Indo-Aryan ethnic group with a rich history stretching back for many centuries. For hundreds of years now, the vast majority of Rohingya have adhered to Islam. In fact, the religion is so intertwined with their identity that many would rather the name Rohingya be replaced with Muslims from Rakhinya with Rakhinya being the state in Myanmar that the majority of them call home. For most of history, Rakhinya state was known as Arakan, a kingdom which went through various periods of being independent and other periods of being a vassal to a nearby power. Things really started to change in the 1780s, when the Third Burmese Empire invaded Arakan and began systematically dismantling its society, deporting able-bodied men back to work in the capital of Burma as slaves and slaughtering anyone who they couldn't find a use for. In the face of this danger, hundreds of thousands of Rohingya were forced to abandon their homes and fled fled west to the nearest place that they could find safety within, which happened to be Bengal, a territory of the East India Company, later officially becoming British India. Here, they were welcomed as refugees, found jobs, and largely integrated with society. The Rohingya would stay here for about a hundred years until Britain decided that they also wanted Burma. After conquering Burma, colonial diplomats found that modern-day Rohingya state was still relatively empty, never having been resettled after everyone fled during the previous conquest. And with so much fertile land to work there, they began incentivizing citizens of British India to move back into Arakan, an offer which was quickly accepted by many people whose families had been kicked out of the area a few generations ago. And this is where the roots of the conflict began to brew. Because from the British perspective, all this migration was seen as internal, essentially just people heading to a different state within the same country. However, many of the locals saw it very differently, especially the Burmese, who felt that their territory was being taken away by these waves of new arrivals. Fast forward a few years, and following World War II, European colonies in South Asia were gaining independence, left and right, and Burma was no exception, securing their sovereignty in 1948. However, the Arakan region did not receive its autonomy like the British had promised, and so they desperately wanted to join the neighboring Muslim-majority East Pakistan, uh, which would later become Bangladesh. However, the Buddhist majority Burmese government vetoed this option and went as far as to say that the Rohingya were nothing more than illegal migrants on stolen land and they didn't want to lose that land to another country. They then began imposing a series of restrictions on the people, limiting their movements outside of Arakan and even denying border entry to Rohingya who had fled to India during the Japanese invasion a few years earlier. Not only did they refuse to let these people come home, the government seized the land and possessions that they left behind. And things got even worse in 1962 when a coup d'etat saw the rise of socialist military government under the ruler of General Ni Win. The military began cracking down on Rohingya even further, removing them from any political positions and expelling many from the army despite years of honorable service. Various social and cultural organizations were banned, including their political party, whose leaders were imprisoned. Sixteen years later, the government began Operation Dragon King, a mission to rid the country of what they deemed foreigners prior to an upcoming national census. Intimidation, murder, and rape were all used as tools to scare the Rohingya out of their homes, resulting in 250,000 of them fleeing to Bangladesh. The majority of these refugees returned home after a repatriation mission through the United Nations, but their troubles would only get worse. In 1982, the military junta passed a new citizenship law, which did not list Rohingya as one of the national races of Burma, which they had based on some archaic British survey from 1823. 
any Rohingya who couldn't easily trace their lineage to one of the national races had their citizenship rights revoked and were immediately considered aliens, once again stateless in their own country. Are you ever driven crazy by robocalls flooding your phone? Well, fear not, because today's video is proudly sponsored by Aura, the superhero of online protection. Imagine data brokers selling your info to robocallers, spammers, and who knows who else. But Aura will step in and help you fight against that nonsense. Aura goes beyond just identifying sneaky data brokers. It takes charge by submitting opt-out requests on your behalf. You want your info removed? Aura's got your back. And that's not all. Setting up Aura is a breeze. No need to juggle multiple apps, parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, you name it, Aura's got it all at an affordable price. So let Aura keep you safe online so you can focus on what matters most. And guess what? You can join Aura by starting your two-week free trial. Just head over to aura.com forward slash shadows, aura.com forward slash shadows. There's also a link below. Don't let your private information be a goldmine for others. Take control with Aura. Link below and now back to today's video. The 1990s saw incredible instability in the nation. The military brutally stomped on pro-democracy protests, renamed the country Myanmar, and initiated another wave of violent military operations targeting Muslims in Rakhine state. And every time refugees were forced to flee Bangladesh, the military simply claimed there was evidence that they didn't belong in Myanmar in the first place. That's around this time that organized Rohingya resistance started to pop up in the form of the Rohingya Solidarity Organization, or RSO. The RSO was based mostly out of Bangladesh and possessed quite an impressive arsenal of AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades. They launched a few attacks on the military, but despite their firepower, they didn't have the logistics or planning to really achieve anything much at the time, and the RSO soon faded away. Now, the saddest part of this story is that by this point, it wasn't just the military persecuting these people, but even other locals. Specifically, Buddhist monks have been some of the worst offenders in the crisis. In 1997, more than 1,500 Buddhist monks marched around the city of Mandalay, shouting anti-Muslim slogans, vandalizing businesses, damaging mosques, and burning the Quran. Three people lost their lives in the riots, and the chaos spread to a few other cities. In Mandalay alone, 18 mosques were completely destroyed, and everything inside of them was stolen. The military hunter, of course, turned a blind eye to all of this. The early 2000s saw even more anti-Muslim sentiment. Monks began distributing propaganda pamphlets, the most notable of which was titled The Fear of Losing One's Race, a not-so-subtle warning that Muslims would take over the country if it was left alone. As for why Buddhists were specifically getting so agitated, it was believed that the controversy between the religions had been stirred up once again due to the Taliban's destruction of the Buddhas of Bamiyan. To be clear, the destruction of this historical and cultural site was not the fault of the Taliban alone, nor Islam or Muslims as a whole, especially considering that nearly every other Muslim-majority nation in the region protested the announcement of their demolition, and many even offered to transport the statues out of Afghanistan for the Taliban, but they were blown up regardless, and even more hate was directed toward the Rohingya as a result. In the city of Twangu, this boiling hate couldn't be contained, and another violent, supposed anti-foreigner riot broke out, which would lead to the deaths of 200 Muslims, the destruction of 11 more mosques, and the burning of over 400 houses. To put into perspective just how heinous this was, the first act of these riots was at the Han Tha Mosque, where the mob entered the building and attacked 20 men who were praying, beating them to death in their place of worship. In the years after, more and more riots continued to break out, and the government continued to allow them to rage for a few more days before shutting them down. A lot of this violence and hatred has coincided with the appearance and rise of a Buddhist nationalist movement called 969, led by a man called Sayadaw Wirathu, whose opinions have earned in the nickname the Buddhist Bin Laden, which pretty much tells you everything you need to know about him. Aside from outright violence, well into the 21st century, Rohingya continued to be marginalized by their government. There are limits in place for how many children they are allowed to birth, they are banned from higher education, denied quality health care, and they need permission for any sort of travel. To top it all off, the Mama government refuses to even use the name Rohingya, instead referring to them as Bengali, alluding to the accusation that they belong to another place and that their ethnicity doesn't even exist. It did look like things were going to get better when Myanmar held their first free election, bringing Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi to the office of state councillor in 2015. But essentially, nothing changed as extreme nationalism continued to have a stranglehold on the population and the military still held immense power in the country. And just when everyone thought that things couldn't get worse for the Rohingya, it got much, much worse. 
In late 2016, a newly formed insurgency group called the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army attacked police stations on the border of Rohingya State, leaving nine officers dead. Following this, the military began their largest anti-Rohingya operation in history, arresting and killing dozens of people within the first few days. Soon, satellite imagery showed over a thousand destroyed homes, and by late November, there were several instances of the military using helicopter gunships to attack crowds of villagers fleeing their homes. The violence was extreme. Survivors spoke of widespread gang rape, burning of homes, schools, and the indiscriminate shooting of children. In early 2017, Reuters reported that 423 people have been detained by the police since the operation began, including 13 children, with the youngest being just 10 years old. Shockingly, the police didn't even deny this. And one captain remarked, We, the police, have to arrest those who collaborated with the attackers, children or not. And this continued all throughout Rakhine. In Situa, a brick-wielding mob attacked a group of seven Rohingya, killing one and injuring the rest who managed to escape. Then a video is released of captured Rohingya men and boys being lined up and systematically beaten by police with batons. Much of the barbaric violence has been targeted against women, and it's been estimated that 50% of Rohingya women have now been the victims of military-sanctioned sexual assault, in most cases involving five or more soldiers assaulting them simultaneously. This is so horrifically common that interviews of refugees often report even higher percentages. A Human Rights Watch interview of 40 women found that 28 had been the victims of such violence, many of them on more than one occasion, including a 15-year-old girl who described how she was dragged from a house by 10 men, barely managing to survive the assault, which took place while she could hear her family being murdered. Another victim was dumped inside a locked house, which the soldiers set on fire, though covered in bruises and burns. She managed to escape. And these statistics don't even include the women who are killed during or after the act. Overall, it is arguably the most widespread instance of sexual violence on the planet. As one soldier proudly put it, we have the authority to rape women. Near the end of 2017, in light of further operations by Rohingya rebels, the government upped the pressure on its crackdown, causing hundreds of thousands to flee north into Bangladesh. Over the months, as more and more refugees followed their path, the military began placing landmines along the border with Bangladesh to prevent anyone from passing through, and would then gun down several crowds as they retreated back south in what was referred to as a genocide zone. All the while, Villages were being systematically looted and razed to the ground to hide evidence of the crimes. Buddhist vigilante organizations aided in this, stealing anything they could get their hands on, such as cows, goats, and motorcycles, and selling them back in the capital, often boasting about their profits to reporters. As the military began demolishing the scenes of their crimes, it became harder and harder for international teams to see what was going on. Myanmar has since outright banned international journalists from entering the conflict zone and even detained two Reuters journalists who found evidence of an unreported mass grave. The two were held for a year before being released. Even intact villages whose inhabitants had left in advance were looted and burned as well, leaving Rakhine State filled with the smoldering ashes of ruined homes and creating a news media black hole that doesn't allow any information to escape except for what the military wants. In fact, state-sponsored propaganda is so unashamed in the region that one news segment interviewed a girl who spoke of violent trauma in her village that had been attacked by the military, but the translation they aired with the video instead claimed the opposite, that she hadn't seen anyone be harmed. This was quickly pointed out by interpreters around the world, but their complaints fell on deaf ears. Because of this media blockage and blatant propaganda, it is quite difficult to know exactly how many Rohingya have been killed by the military since the beginning of the operation, and estimates range from 25,000 to over 50,000. A UN investigation found that an estimated 116,000 were beaten by security forces, and another 36,000 were thrown into fires. Now, escaping Myanmar has become a difficult task, as the government began blocking the most common crossings on foot. In the years since, many have made daring trips in crowded fishing boats, ending up in Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, who generally aren't that willing to help. In fact, in Thailand, many of the refugees simply faced more rejection, as in a few instances, government employees were caught simply shipping them back out to sea with no food or water, where they would end up floating for weeks until another ship happened to stumble upon them. While communities of these refugees can be found in several countries, such as Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, the largest concentration by far is found in Bangladesh, the country home to an estimated 1.3 million Rohingya. Around 860,000 of them live in refugee camps near the border, and astonishingly, 600,000 of them 
them live in a single camp, Kutapalong. It's difficult to comprehend just how many people are living in that one spot. It's about the equivalent of the entire population of Dresden, Germany, except everyone here is living in tents and makeshift shelters. The camp itself is located in a district called Cox's Bazaar, named after the British diplomat who oversaw the first wave of Rohingya refugees to the region hundreds of years ago, and has a main office which is supported by the United States, the European Union, Japan, Canada, and the IKEA Foundation. And that's because the furniture store has donated tens of millions of dollars to supporting displaced Rohingya over the years. It is true that living in Kutapalong camps means that you're safe from the Myanmar military. However, that doesn't mean that it's overall a safe place to live. For starters, the camp was formed by leveling thousands of acres of forest, disrupting the habitat of local wildlife, which now pay regular visits, including Asian elephants who encounter the camp on their migratory route. Agitated elephants killed 14 people in 2019, leading to the creation of a volunteer force called Elephant Response Teams, which will rush to the scene and try to scare the elephants away from damaging anyone's property. They've even constructed towers to spot the animals before they suddenly show up in the camp, as they will often sneak in during the night before getting stuck on something and going berserk. Before the elephant response team, people would bang pots and pans together as an effort to scare off the 12,000-pound animal. One man, Foyz Ulla, described to NPR how he emerged from his house one morning to find the body of his neighbor, who had been killed the night before when an elephant stepped on his chest. Natural disasters also pose a serious threat to the camp's inhabitants, especially floods. Because most of the shelters are made from various combinations of bamboo mats, tops, and spare pieces of wood, heavy rain and flash floods can devastate the infrastructure. And on the flip side, fires are also a big problem since the shelters are constructed so close together and people cook with open flames wherever they can find a space. The largest of these fires damaged or destroyed 600 homes before the flames could be extinguished. Disasters like these have displaced thousands of Rohingya within the camp itself, forcing them to move into someone else's home until they can find or make a new one. Surviving these events is only part of the battle, though, as every day the Rohingya struggle to fill their stomachs with enough food. Despite efforts to bring in international aid, the immense population of the camp simply doesn't get the calories it needs, with most meals consisting of rice and lentils purchased with electronic vouchers. It has been found that a third of the children in the camp are chronically undernourished, as are a significant portion of pregnant women. And, of course, always accompanying malnutrition is disease, which runs rampant throughout the often unsanitary conditions of the camp. To buy more food, refugees have attempted to earn money by working in the surrounding countryside, but the local Bangladeshi often want nothing to do with the camp's inhabitants, who they see as only bringing crime and drugs to their communities. And there's a grain of truth here, as drugs are a serious problem in the camp. The most popular being traded in the camp is Yaba, which is essentially methamphetamine mixed with a lot of caffeine. Along with the illicit substances, smugglers are also known to kidnap women and children to be sold to human traffickers who blackmail their victims with being returned to Myanmar if they ever attempt to escape. For children in the camp, education is practically non-existent, and not only is it not present at the moment, there are currently no plans to bring teachers in or train adults to teach, meaning if the camp stays here long term, there will be an entire generation of children that don't receive any education whatsoever, threatening to start a generational cycle that will only worsen their already crippling poverty. And despite many Rohingya having electronic devices of some sort, many of them have been completely cut off from the internet by the Bangladeshi government, who has been consistently shutting down connection in the area, citing vague criminal concerns. Advocates have pointed out that shutting off cellular connection only means that victims of crime can't call the police in time. But the wireless service blackouts still remain. One way that Bangladeshi life is trying to solve some of the issues in the camp is by suggesting that around 100,000 of them relocate to an island. The island is called Basan Char, and it's formed from Himalayan silt pouring into the sea. It may sound like it's just a pile of sand, but it's actually quite large, and Bangladesh plans to construct tens of thousands of homes there, a process which is well underway. However, not only do most of the Rohingya themselves object to moving to Basan Char, so do most human rights groups, who say the inhabitants there would receive the full force of tropical typhoons, something that generally doesn't reach the camp's current location. But Bangladesh really wanted to see if people could live comfortably there, and so they got their hands on some refugees to test it. A group of 300 Rohingya were detained after arriving in Malaysia in a boat, and they were sent back out to sea when Malaysia denied them access. The Bangladeshi Navy rescued them, but citing something about the pandemic and quarantine times, they threw them on the island to see how they'd like it, and have since begun moving more families in. 
Currently, around 30,000 Rohingya live there, and the government says they plan to finish building the infrastructure to have Rohingya permanently inhabit Basan Shah, even going so far as to say that although they could work and contribute to the national economy, they would never leave the islands. Now, while so many Rohingya endure the hardships of living in such a camp for now, the majority hope that they can one day return to their homes, a peaceful Rohingya state. But as time goes on, this seems less and less likely. In 2021, the situation in Myanmar deteriorated even further when the recently installed democratic government of the country was ousted in another coup d'etat set into action to prevent the winners of the 2020 election from being sworn into office. This, coupled with the military junta's execution of several protesters, ignited the now ongoing Myanmar civil war, which is seeing the rise of many different factions and militias fighting insurgencies to take back the country. Not including the Rohingya, who left the country before this began, 1.3 million people have been internally displaced, and casualties already include 13,000 children. The military has been making extensive use of their air force to bomb civilian infrastructure, and now have destroyed more than 60,000 residential buildings. The war is also seeing the forced recruitment of child soldiers as the military gets more and more desperate to fill in its lower ranks. The future of the country is as uncertain as ever, especially as it seems that the various rebel groups are actually winning many of their battles and potentially control more than half of the country's territory. One can see an outcome where the end of the current civil war might usher in a new era for Myanmar, perhaps one that could repatriate the Rohingya back to their homeland, where they could be allowed to live peacefully. But perhaps this is being overly optimistic. This would be the fourth or fifth time that hundreds of thousands of Rohingya have been brought back to Myanmar after fleeing genocide. And each time they've returned in the past, it's only taken a few years before another conflict inevitably erupted and drove them from their homes once again. A safe future for Rohingya will not only require stability in Myanmar as a whole, but also the dismantling of Buddhist national groups who have been responsible for much of the suffering. Until this pointless ethnic hatred comes to an end, it seems that the Rohingya are doomed to remain a stateless people, persecuted, beaten, and murdered for just being who they are.